It was what I call jumping in without even fucking looking. This is what I call just fuck, let's just go. Let's LFG full send. Uh, we'll fix it in post. Fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> what does LFG mean? Limp fucking let's, let's fucking, fucking go. Go. That's or much better than gooch. a limp fucking gooch. I don't know. Yeah, I don't That's even available. know what that means. No one knows what it means. It's provocative. I think it I mean, that's better. the front and the back have been so <sighs> taxingly used that the middle has started to sag. Because, <laughs> you know, the oh, gooch is just a and fleshy that's, fun bridge. Oh. And that's when you need to put the pussy on the chain wax. <laughs> yes. That do be when <clears throat> the pussy needs to be on the chain wax. <laughs> It's time for another episode of the Black Tower Podcast. He's going to need to clean that up later, and it's going to be funny. He's going to be uh, a little annoyed. It's going to be like that, uh, that post-drunk, hungover piss in the morning. Oh, kind of dribbles yeah. everywhere, and you're just like, I'll deal with it later. <laughs> you're like, you're then the girlfriend goes in there and gets pissed. Ha, you're describing pissed, literally pissed. every morning for me, my guy. Get pissed. Uh, all right go to work every morning after a certain age. hangover <laughs> guys i propose a toast to all of us bread being or here. white bread wow <laughs> you are just sassy punny andrew is on fire tonight yeah you've missed like the three or four that he did before you, you got on here you didn't waste them all before the show did you he didn't he better not have Oh, toast. never! Toast it's toast. never wasted when you can get wasted on the show. Hey, there you go. All right, guys, to another episode of the Black Tower Podcast. After a needed week off, apparently, where we all got back to <laughs> basics, and we'll hit it hard this week. So, cheers! Yeah, cheers! Mm. I need a whiskey now called Basics, so you can go back to basics. Mm. Yeah, it's your palate cleanser actually after you do a whiskey that's like think, real intense. I think that's a great idea. Um, you don't want to blow out your palate. Mm-hmm. Uh, Patreons, you guys know what to do, right? Convert, spread the word of our Lord and Savior, the taint, the dark one's taint. We need more Patreons so that Andrew can start up a line of whiskey called the Basics. And your 20 year. The twenty year will be uh, the dark ones basic. The Black bitch Tower taint. basics bitch brew. Ah, no, that was literally it's what I was going to say. The it's the perfect. line would be called the basic, and you would have things like pumpkin spice and like UGG boots and like yes. <laughs> each that's, year would be like a different or like your that's our brewery. Year would be this. Yeah, exactly. There you go. For beer. Yeah, love it. Then we'd have I'm to have a separate distillery wing for the whiskey. I but love it. when you're spreading the word of the Black Tower podcast, you might be faced with such hard to answer questions like, "Who is that?" And we're <laughs> here to tell you, I'm your boss, John Mahal. My name is Andrew, at least legally within 49 of the 50 United States. I am your Amon Khan Mahal, and wow. I am rainbows. Not oh, legally I mean, in so any cool. of the 50 states. <laughs> <laughs> and I am your Soravon Mahal, Josh, and sometimes known as Sprinkles in select communities. I there you didn't go. didn't forget that I was supposed to introduce myself as you. <laughs> it's okay, unicorns. Now we just need a sunshine. You're fine. Well, we can have I sunshine, rainbows, because it's unicorns, rain. and sprinkles. Until oh Professor God. Plutonium added an extra ingredient. Chemical <laughs> X. X. Ingredient X. chemical X. Dark ones taint. Dark Excuse ones me, taint. Professor that's... Plutonium, why were you making little girls in your basement? We're not gonna don't don't that's the wrong question to ask. 
Okay, so here's what, here's what's gonna happen. Uh, I'm giving you two homework. Right That's now. okay. I need, My, I need like I a, was an accident too. Like a five to ten second clip of you guys like laughing maniacally, and I'm going to make a TikTok. Sugar, spice, and everything nice. And then the dark one's taint is gonna come in, and it's gonna form us, and we're gonna be like. Ah. Nice. It's just well, that in that like case, TikTok sound effect of somebody violently shitting themselves. Can we do? Can you guys do us? Do me a favor. <laughs> we can absolutely do this TikTok, and I'm all for it. But one of us needs to be dressed all in pink. One of us needs to be dressed all in green, and one of us needs to be dressed all in blue. So let's okay. make this happen. Let's make it I'm happen. In. Uh, leave I'll a comment below pink. if you want this to I'll happen. Figure out a pink, and we'll make this happen. Leave yeah, but this. let us know down below in the comments or let us know in the Discord after you listen to this or watch this or whatever you do. Which one of us should wear all of what color? There we go. Ooh. All right. I like that one. Let us let us know. And the most popular of the choices will win. <laughs> now, and we, then can just, we can do another TikTok afterwards that's just the like the the whatever boys that are just like dressed up like the oh the, the rowdy rough boys. The rowdy oh, rough boys. Yes. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I want to do it. Uh, yikes. All right, cool. But so, after we've given you all of our good ideas. Is uh, that our street gang name in Camelin? Yes. <laughs> the Rowdy Rough Boys. Look out, it's the Ashman. Oh, uh, no, that's the Mahales. They're known as the Rowdy Rough Boys. They're known as the Rowdy Rough Boys. You but you know who them. we are. We you are the Black them smoking Tower. smoking that chewing tobacco and pod. They're pass. smoking that like two rivers to leaf. Discuss the wheel of time and all things wheelie timey um it's a fun thing that we like to do it's a it's a weekly thing if you if you're just joining us welcome to the black tower podcast welcome to the black tower i should start saying that just welcome to the black tower as uh you know welcome to the tower uh, tower not to be confused with another tainted we got wine and euthanasia known as the great blight or as some mm-hmm. would call it the great blight.com which as we know and as you may not know was uh founded and run by the nabliss himself right don't let him fool you it wasn't the dark one nabliss is responsible for the great blight.com if you want wheel of time information about all burr, kinds burr, of things burr. wheel of time just take a trip up to the great blight dot com and then you can get all of your wheel of time information you can get uh content creators who do all kinds of stuff not us because we're slackers and we haven't been posting there recently <clears throat> um i wish i'm putting that on me too like that's that's a that's a three-way call out remember and everywhere where to post all the stuff is do we need a list you gotta have like you know. a cha- like a, a board <laughs> checklist right next to you. That's what I'm saying. We need a list. That's what's good. You know what? That's gonna be our homework. We're gonna we're gonna get someone to make a list for us. Um, and actually, leave a comment below. Be like, hey, I go here all the time, and you guys aren't posting your stuff, so I want to see it there. Boom. Where would you like to now see I've, our stuff? Now I've crowdsourced our responsibilities. Oh, genius. Um, I'm just waiting for the responses to be Tumblr, OnlyFans, <laughs> and DeviantArt. Tumblr. Oh, Tumblr. Oof. DeviantArt. There's a name I haven't Oof. heard in a while. That's okay. a name I haven't heard in quite some time. After oh. you've gone to thegreatblight.com. Well, of course back. I know him. He's me. He's me. <laughs> come back down to Black Tower Pod. Dot com because Which one it's of the you greatest spin all website my ever me. created. Indeed. Um, and I'm not just saying that because it was me that created it. I'm saying it because it's true. Objectively speaking, with no bias. But speaking of other things that are true without any bias, you need to be protected before we get into this episode's topic. And that is true. This week's for the Connor Daniel, comes, you, you good there, buddy? Your hair's coming out? <laughs> it's not coming out it's just being completely reckless and no sign of order Bats. or i mean i know it's the black chaos the, the black chaos the, the black chaos 
Well, I know it's the Black Tower and it's just completely <laughs> chaos, but at the same time, like, come on. Is that what happens that when you eat too much Camelin Bell and you release Moshin Shin within the tower? Do you create Ice black peppers. chaos? Black <laughs> chaos, yeah. Black chaos. All right, protection time. Protection <laughs> time, courtesy of your friendly neighborhood, Norm. Here we go. Hello. I'm Tam Sorrell Norm. You may remember me from the Dusty Wheel or the Black Tower podcast. I'm here to give you a public service announcement about spoilers, as this episode may contain some. As if you didn't already know that, like watching the film Titanic and being surprised that the boat sinks at the end of the movie. Hello, <laughs> moron. The movie is called Titanic. Of course, the boat fracking sinks. This show is called the Black Tower Podcast, as in from the Wheel of Time. And these three guys are Ashaman. Well, at least two of them. I don't know about that Josh guy. Anyway, you have been warned. Look, I got my degree from the Black Tower online. It is a perfectly legitimate method of getting a Black Tower degree. No, uh I do not have the STD that went along with it. But you I curious, put my Mahal able... pants on just like everybody else, <laughs> one ear at a time. That's right. Am I the only one who actually attended the Black Tower? What the fuck is that? <laughs> I uh, started with you guys have. I did the distance no learning idea course. What goes on there. <laughs> I did the distance learning course. I had to uh, film myself blowing up Wait, rocks. What? What dorm did you stay in? <laughs> Uh, I was in the 361st Vipers. Okay, definitely did not attend the Black Tower. How about you? <laughs> what, what dorm were you in? I mean, I can follow suit and say the 342nd Eagles. Uh, wow. Neither of you really went to the Black Tower. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a Daniel's different like, military organization. Who knows? Daniel, Daniel's like, is this how you guys feel all the time? Like, this is nice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I love it. I Josh, love it. tell the people Hi. who and or what and or where and or why. Actually, are we now before you do that? I just want to like I want now to like have the dorms or like the barracks at the Black Tower have like the dorkiest names like <laughs> Earth, Wind, Sunshine, and Rainbows Fire, and Sprinkles. No, 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 no. But like something that's also Wheel of Time related. So it'd be like Earth, oh. Wind, and Fire. And then we'd also have Spirit and Water. <laughs> and Water. And then like, because Water and Spirit are like considered to be like less talented for the men, like the guys well, who are in Water, water and Spirit barracks, we could just be like, yeah. That, air, air and Water. water. Spirit is equal, but Air yeah. and Water. It's like air, you could be like, the guys house. who are in the Air and Water barracks, you could be like, <laughs> You know, I wouldn't put too much stock in what he said. He was he was a water barracks. <laughs> I mean, I'm Ooh. just saying. <laughs> and Don't then there there's study. the there's... one guy who's the really good at all of them, and we just call him Ang. <laughs> That's it, guys. We have connected Avatar the Last Airbender to the Wheel of Time universe. I don't okay. want to live on this farm anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to live in this barracks. They all anymore. lived in harmony until the fire barracks attacked. Yep. Wouldn't that make Everything all Chandler's when the fire avatars, though? Yes, exactly. Technically speaking. That I mean, is correct. I would imagine that in a world where everybody can already use all the elements, that avatar would have a different meaning. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the whole point. Rand no. is the avatar. Nakomi is the avatar. You know, uh, Shadow Haran is the avatar. We already put Which that on. Way? Have you guys we already read... put that on? Have you guys read Origins yet? Yes, I've read the Andrew. front cover. Ah, son of a bitch! How are we but, supposed yes. to invite Michael Livingston out to the Black Tower if you haven't read his book? Yeah. I've read his name. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, Dr. Livingston, if you're listening, you know, please come out to the Black Tower. Yeah. I'll send it you is, a tweet later. It is on the to-do docket as soon as I can actually get shit fucking settled out. 
No, I, very I close. It's all good. Very close. It's all good. I, um, I'm mostly giving you shit. Um, I, now I'm distracted by listening to a docu series. So it's it. Ha- yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that one's. But good, if you anyway. are looking for a book series that is actually somewhat similar to Avatar, Chiboy is reading Mistborn for the first time, and that one so is good, right? actually a little Avatar esque. There are more than just one avatar but most people can only use one metal or one you one type of element. chew on your fucking rust but there are a few who can ruin use all of them so i do want to read it i started reading that when i started the job good. i'm in now and yeah. i made it into seven pages before i got so i busy. i i was reading so bad. i'm i'm in the middle of reading uh the the lost metals the one that just came mm-hmm. out only to find out that I missed like two books. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, son well, and of a bitch. I will say, Brandon, I just want to say, since I know that you're a listener, you're a lovely writer. I absolutely He's a think that you're yeah. absolutely wonderful. I do not want to like actually bring you down at all for any of this. But also, I will Daniel. say that putting out the books one through 14 is definitely <laughs> less confusing than putting the books out okay well this trilogy is here and this trilogy is over here and this trilogy is all the way over here and then i'm writing two books that are between these two trilogies and then one book that's between and you're like okay Brian, love you but could you please release them in order <laughs> like, i mean you know what can you do what can you do all I right, know, that's well, why we have Wikipedia. It gives you the read order for everything. It's time to talk about the gerbil in the room. Let's talk turkey. All right, let's talk turkey. And right, I will tell you, gentlemen. I will tell you what the subject is, and I can I'll tell, tell you, you what. what the subject of this episode is with one dramatic interpretation of the written word upon the books. And Daniel's shaking his head because he already knows what I'm going to do. Andrew, you might want to take your your phones off. <clears throat> Asterix, they'll fire an entire goddamn castle tower. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we're oh. talking Robin, Robin, Imp, Daddy, Dickwad. Okay, I, I think that's a suitable. Is that a suitable title for him, Pimp Daddy Dickwad? I'm gonna say yeah. yes. I'm gonna it's say like, he's an absolute piece. He's piece like the him. villain verse, like aesthetic version of uh, fucking Reed Richards. Like Reed Richards minus the science, add the magic. That's Are if, you if, only like, saying if, wait, because wait, Reed Richards wait. has the gray wings yes, in his hair? Absolutely. Is that, the that is the only, only reason. reason they <laughs> that is that. Well, that is ninety percent of the reason. Like, if you took Reed Richards and gave him the Doctor Strange storyline, but from the What If series, Ravi. No, you know what? Stephen That's Strange. a lot more accurate. Stephen Strange, You're who saying, already wait, has the gray wings. Wait, wait. Oh yeah, that's Stephen fair. Strange <laughs> or Reed Richards. But Robbie so doesn't have the both, shaky hands. Both Reed Richards and uh, Stephen Strange but have the aren't stuck on permanent wings right but here. But Reed on the Richards side of the head. is stretchy man, Correct. and Stephen Strange is magic man. Correct. Yeah, that's what I've said. You can take Reed Richards, but give him the Doctor Strange story. Which is funny because, of course, Stephen Strange already has the component that he's asking for from Reed Richards, which is the yeah. humor in this. But he has a broken component that I don't want Robin to have, and that's the, the, the shaky hands. Shaky hands. Yeah, because they never I think, healed. I think the broken component because of Robin he is... he drove like douchebag, so... Like on one hand, if you drive like a douchebag in a fancy sports car, you might like lose your entire career profession and everything you ever worked for. But I'm reality mess up warping this whole man's powers. career. I'm not saying go and do this. I'm just saying it worked out for Stephen Strange. Yes. Kind of. Because he All still right. lost the game. All right. All right. 
Anyway, anyway, so yes, tonight we're discussing Ravin. You know him I, as one of the Forsaken or one of the Chosen, depending well, I feel like, on where I feel like your Watt fandom, loyalties lie. I feel like WattFandom.com was after our own hearts whenever they chose the introductory quote for the Wikipedia entry for Ravin. And it is a quote from Lou Theron referring to Ravin while in Rand's mind, and he says that Ravin... He likes to come from behind or at your flanks. And I imagine that he actually does a handful of those uh, in the book series. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Mm. Not in a good mm. way at all. Oh, no. Look, we are definitely look. going to have a little bit of a problem in this episode because, I mean, oh, all of us hate yes. this character for what they do. Um, but I also love the character as they are written. I think it's extremely believable, which is what I want in a character. I just hate that the believable means that there's got to be a character who does this kind of shit. Well, let's let's describe so, the uh, the shit this person. Uh, so Ravine uh, was said to be as handsome as Lanfear was beautiful, or rather. As handsome as Lanfear is beautiful. Well, no, she got the reborn thing. Kind of downgraded slightly. But hey, original Lanfear. The OG Lanfear. Um, you know, Age of Legends release vintage. Uh, but he had, a, he had uh, an insatiable appetite for the company of beautiful women. He had black hair, which was white at the temples, um, as we've talked about with uh, the Reed Richards and Stephen Strange comparisons. Um, he was dark of complexion with nearly completely black eyes, also noted for having a remarkably large stature, taller than Rand Al Thor, according to Matt, but with broader broader shoulders and a deeper chest. What is it? Oh, okay. It's like a thicker chest. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His chest was yeah. thicker than a snicker. I got it. So he, he fucking yoked all this dude. Robin That's is not yoked. natural. This dude is fucking using roids, all right? He's this guy, natty. he's been so he's been swollen. You natty, bro? No, no, not at all. His his pecs be swollo. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the quotes we have is, he was a handsome man, almost as good looking as Galad, and nearly as youthful seeming, despite the white shrieking his temples, but built on a bigger scale, with more than Rand's height and very nearly Perrin's shoulders. So taller than Rand. That is actually the Matt quote that they are referring so, to. Yeah. Uh, so taller than Rand Althor, according to Matt. Taller than just Rand. So we say almost as broad as Perrin, and maybe half as effective a military leader. That as means him. Perrin is more of a beefcake still. Yeah. Perrin's still the smallest. I don't care what anybody says. Perrin's still the smallest. Does that mean that he's Perrin Swallow? I mean, yes. he might just be more compact, which makes everything, like if he's shorter, everything else might build out further. Except that, of course, in the show, he's not. Well, yeah. Well, that's the show. Well, I just I love mean, that, like, I, I'm i pretty sure Marcus is, is he as tall as uh, Yosha, or is he taller? Uh... I know that they are at least of a height, and he might actually be just a little bit taller yes. than Yosha. Yes, they are of a height. I'm going to kick you in the dick. You know what that <laughs> phrase is. So, let's see. Marcus Rutherford is 6'5". I was just pulling up Yosha right now. Oh, yeah, you were pulling up Yosha. Mr. Sadowski is 6'2". Perrin is actually yeah. three. So he's well, three, three, is three four four inches lot taller than, than Yosha. So Probably he not is the only just... place he's got three more inches. <laughs> ha ha ha! Yeah, in his shoulders, at least. Fun, fun story. When I googled Yosha Stradowski, um, the top four questions that people also ask, how old is Yosha Stradowski? What movies has Yosha Stradowski been in? Is Yosha Stradowski ginger? <laughs> and is Yosha Stradowski Dutch? That's what other people are asking about our Lord and Savior, Randall Thor, the Dragon Reborn. Indeed. Well, because they really need to know whether he has a soul or not. That's Wait, really the important part. He has a girlfriend. I believe you. 
I mean, he's a good looking bro. Don't get me wrong. Well, and now he's famous, which is nice. And appar- apparently his favorite things are books and traveling. So really? okay, look, uh wikibio.in. You can't put Prague as one of his favorite destinations where that's where he worked for literally two years of his life. Yeah, you can. That that's like saying my favorite place to travel is work. No, not if work is exotic. Yes, if work is the plant outside of Ogden, Utah, then, <laughs> then maybe you can't say that. But if, you're, if your work destination is Prague, then you can kind of get away with like, saying that. Shut up, sexy more shoddy. Nobody asked you. I mean, if also, you want to know just because you have a favorite place is in a place, does it make the overarching <laughs> place your favorite place? You just have favorite places within that place. So, um, yes. okay. So, Robin, Robin, uh, he did have he had the white wings. Um, fun Which story. Which is much better also, than the red wings, as well as <clears throat> debatable. Um, <laughs> speak for yourself, sir. <laughs> no, I'm not keep shaming do. anybody. I only ever do, sir. Um, Robin is actually considered to be one of the most powerful channelers right up on par with uh, Luz Theron slash Randall Four. He's he's there. Like, like it's it's one of those like, are they who's stronger? We don't actually know because it hasn't actually happened, but they're there they're there yep in fact we discovered this last week or two weeks ago when we were doing our last episode when we were talking about the sort of different power levels between the (laughs) age of legends and now uh where rand moradin ishamayel uh ravin and i believe samayel were actually all on the same level as far as their ability to channel sidine so yeah, more more or less, yeah. Um, so Ravine was born Arid Mosinel, uh, and always loved power and was envious of anyone who held more of it than himself. Um, interestingly, uh, there's not much known about Ravine uh, for us as the readers before he joined the Shadow. Um, mm-hmm. But we do know that during his time serving the Shadow, he seemed to prefer diplomacy of sorts. Uh, very debatable if you can call what he did diplomacy um, yeah. over outright attack uh, he would more so practice things like subversion and coercion rather than it, diplomacy. His brand of diplomacy was compulsion now you just want to do what I want you to do so we're going to... and manipulation mm-hmm. well, Okay but again I want to throw out there that that's not totally fair because there is another example of what you're talking about that is even more intense because of course Grandal goes into a place compulses everybody to the point where they're basically a husk of their former self sure and then says I rule here now la 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 mm-hmm. Um, versus Ravin, who in the story goes into Camelin, compulses Morgays, and likely a number of her other sort of friends, lords, nobles, whatever, um, and then also a number of the other rival lords and nobles and whatnot, and then just basically makes it so that he is the de facto ruler of uh came of of andor but he never actually supplants more gates she does what he wants her to do because she is compulsed that's absolutely true but technically she is still the queen he doesn't just like make her not well, he a pu- queen he puppet and... governs yeah he puppet governs which is yeah. distinctly different than somebody like grandall who is now basically the ruler of wherever you just Grind- don't know where she is. And Grindel so you're like, ah. Blitzkrieg, Blitzkrieg's compulsion. Yes. And exactly. Robin, he is, he is, it feels more like he's more tactful and subtle. Yeah. Yes. 
He uses um, more pins, pinpoints than Blitzkrieg's. Yeah. I agree which, with that. Which makes him, he's more, he takes more of the route of like the, the slow spy based uh, mm-hmm. subversion uh, and overthrowing from, in, from inside of a government, where, which the most effective way you can do this, of course, is if that government never knows it ever happened. Yes, they, and that's why I want to throw out support. there that Josh's statement was not incorrect. It was not. He does go in, he compulses the person, he he. they then do what he wants them to do, but it is a little bit of a different... I find that statement to suggest more Grendel than Robin. Robin is so much more dastardly and manipulative with what he's doing there, than someone like Grendel, who, as we said, is like Blitzkrieg corruption or uh, compulsion. Yeah. So, you I know, mean, I was just going to say one of the things I absolutely love with reference to this particular scenario is that the difference in compulsion, you know, again, you have the White Tower that says compulsion is wrong, it's, mm-hmm. it's nasty and and absolutely disgusting and it's terrible and you should never do it and then they're like oh yeah i kind of just made my warder do this and it's like okay so that's a very incredibly subtle version of compulsion which we can debate in another episode i'm not gonna go there at this moment but then you have on the other side of it you have the full extreme of grendel Mm -hmm. when she casts compulsion Rand slash lose at the time says, uh, you know, look, Grendel's compulsion is a one-way street. Yep. Once she lays that upon your mind, everything is destroyed, and all that is left is the overwhelming desire to serve Grendel. Yes. And that is all the information is still in the head. And actually. Mm-hmm. And actually, I will say, look, the bail firing of Natron's Barrow is a horrible atrocity. Of course it is. But the way can we it like wasn't just, a war crime. Can we recognize that the way it was executed was actually kind of brilliant? Never a because war crime the they got time. they got the messenger, they sat his ass down, they confirmed that he was compulsed by Grendel, and then Randall was like, cool. Yeah, just hold him there for a second. And then Rand went, bail fire, KO can attack times 3,000, DBZ reference. Destroyed the entire thing and then went back to the dude and was like, is he still compulsed? And they were like, no, now he's just an empty husk of a human being. And Rand went, cool, we got it. And then went on yes. with his life. Yep. The, I mean, so it was horrible, but the way it was executed was kind of brilliant. And and sorry, I realized I just got off on a track on this. But Robin has sort of a more Mogedian style presence. Oh, the, absolutely. Well, I would say even, that Mogedian and Ravin have a lot more in common than sort of Grandal and Ravin, yes. even though, again... The comparisons are many. So yes. again, it's it's certainly not a situation of just strictly one versus the other or anything. And, but yes. And even when you compare Mogedian compulsion to Robin compulsion, Mogedian comes in, compulses you, gets all the information she wants out of you, and then goes, Whoop, and she's gone again, and you're left going, what just happened? Mm-hmm. Oh, I was eating. Well, I mean, huh, weird. And what's... Robin, Robin lays a compulsion. That is a one-way street, but does not erase who you were. Well, you will so, spend the rest of your life going, oh, I hope Robin's not mad at me. No, no, he compulsed me. And it's it's a constant struggle. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. So one of the things that we learned from Lanfear is that compulsion is at its strongest whenever you command someone into an action that already aligns with what they want, at yes. least to an extent. And where I think Ravin as a manipulator and a compulsor shines is his ability to not only figure out what people want and twist it into a way to where he starts nudging them to do things that they already, like they can logically draw a connection to. Mm-hmm. Yes. He, saw, he uses micro doses 
of compulsion to edge these individuals into doing the actions he does. I don't think he does a single He's just kind of like more gays all yeah, the time. He doesn't do like a single thing of compulsion on more gays and say, you will listen to what I have to say and give it more weight than anybody else. Yeah. I think that he comes in as a Lord Gabriel or Lord Jabril, and he very slowly talks with and like bends the ear Lord of the queen Gerbil. as he works his way up, the, all the while compulsing the people around him and around the queen to give yes. him higher standing and more weight behind his voice. And then when he gets into the queen's court and literally becomes her consort, he then can start not only just playing the, the compulsion oh. game, but the pillow talk game. Because you got to remember, this, this is a guy that this, this isn't the first time he's done anything like this. In fact, he's accomplished inherently, incredibly more notable feats in the past. Because when mm -hmm. he worked, whenever he, well, he has always been for the shadow in the books, um, you know, that we uh, in the timeline that we're reading, but through his tactics of this behind the scenes or shadow manipulation uh, and compulsion of governments, he didn't just get a couple cities to surrender. He got several regions to surrender yeah. to the shadow without a single drop of bloodshed, without a single, well, I'm not going to say that, without any invasion having to take place. Yes. Um, and he was because of this, he was known, or this was part of why he was known to be a great military general and a good governor, uh, albeit his lack of attention to detail, which generally seems to be largely attributed to his proclivity for spending time with his lovers and consorts. Whenever we see Ravine in, um, in Camelin with Morghais, he has other consorts that are running around the palace because mm -hmm. Morghais. She knows about up, them. Yeah, she wasn't talking about them and how they annoy her that he's not being completely faithful just to her. Yep. But it's, I think it, this might be one of the, the things that Robin does that is unintentionally advantageous for him. Because instead of Borghais being able to spend time sitting there thinking about why she's doing the things she's doing to Camelot and Andor, she keeps finding herself distracted because she sees another one of Ravine's lovers scurrying around and it keeps her Ooh. distracted. But because the distraction is centered on Lord Jabril, it also keeps her mind focused on him and what she feels and thinks for him or thinks she does. Yep. So I don't know how much of that is intentional on Ravine's part and how much of it isn't because on one hand, there's like statements about Ravine being uh, really bad about paying attention to details and little things often slipping his notice and hurting productivity like during the war of power but then there's also the things oh, he's very he's described as very careful and meticulous so it's got to be one or one of two things like either he's not careful and meticulous or all of his little mistakes and blunders are you know designed failings for an end goal and i could see that happening with more gays he is careful and meticulous to the point, and we'll see if this makes sense. He is careful and meticulous to the point where you're almost like, no, that is, that is way too, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That is way too minute. Uh, it's way too detailed. It's way, it's way too specific. There's absolutely no way anyone is laying a trap or a plan so intricate as to manipulate the kind of situations happening that are happening right now. But it I think I think what you have in Robin is similar to the compulsion weaves that Varen has sort of guessed upon and sort of uh, started creating on her own, which me, which was in effect a weave of compulsion, a very, some would say a very weak weave of compulsion, but it was a weave of compulsion that if you straight up did not want to do it, it wouldn't work on you. So what Varen had to do was very carefully lay that weave upon someone and then 
be very, very careful with the wording and questioning, which I said I are very, very adept at, in order to make someone think they're giving you the information they want to give you for their own personal benefit. And I and I'm drawing this like uh this parallel or this connection for the first time right now because that's how robin operated he used uh, initially he used the mistrust of the lords and ladies who were not in favor of house tricand to gain initial power to gain entry as andrew was saying entry into the court and once he was in the court, he started to build up. And so as he gained favor of the queen, he started punishing and banishing other people for seemingly logical reasons. More gays would banish someone or punish someone. And she'd be like, I am confident that what I did was appropriate, proper, and correct because they, wait a minute. They have been allies of House Tricand for a hundred years. Why would they be like that? That is so terrible of them. It's probably a good thing that I banished them when I did. And what we learn later on, of course, is that it's all Robin. And Elaine has real trouble undoing that damage later on during her succession battle. Yep. So uh, let's go ahead and take a step back for just a moment, because uh, I think that these discussions are best when they are left to sort of overarching themes and fun fun parallels and connections and things like that. But unfortunately, we sometimes do a bit of a disservice by not sort of talking about their their events throughout the books. Oh, yes. So I want to just take a step back for a moment and just sort of go through... Uh, not with, you know, no commentary on it whatsoever, but at the same time uh, with, you know, a little bit um, of of just a, a through line of sort of Ravine's activities. So as stated, uh, upon his release, uh, Perrin is staying in the Mountains of Mist uh, after the events of the end of, of uh, the Great Hunt the the book the great hunt um he dreams of meeting Bal or of a meeting of balal and ravine in a place resembling the ways which we know basically is the wolf dream and they're just meeting in Teleran and riyadh and perrin has just kind of found himself there you don't really learn that until later but you basically do um now He doesn't know who either of these two people actually are at the time. We really, again, realize that it's too forsaken later. Um, but we do sort of uh, understand them to this meeting to be important. And later on, we find out that it is actually Belal and uh, Ravin who seem to have some kind of alliance going on. And then Ishamayel shows up and everything gets a little fucky. And then it's over. Um, then he shows up in Camelin as Lord Gabriel, uh, a, a nobleman apparently from the Mountains of Mist, um, and sets up camp nobleman. in Andor. Yeah. Uh, he uses, well, it's hard to say whether he just uses the city's, uh, unrest at the time that he shows up or whether he actually instigates some of the city's unrest so that there is a set of riots that happen in the city that some are for and some are against Queen Morghese because Queen Morghese is starting to be a little bit unpopular for a number of reasons that we actually start finding out in the very first book because That's when right. Rand and Matt show up in Camelin, there right. is red wrappings on swords and white wrappings on swords uh, and the red wrappings are actually more expensive, probably because they are. Wait, no, is it the white? It's the white. The white, the is white, white. are the white is more expensive because they are yeah. more popular. Yes, and, and the white capitalism. ones. And so the white ones are actually more popular because they're selling better, 
uh, or they're more expensive because they're selling better because more people seem to be not as in favor of the queen. And so Rand actually ends up buying the red ones, which gets him in good with Basil Gill at the inn that they're staying in. Um, well, again, good as I said, I know, a right? Good, a good queen's man after my own heart. So again, you're talking about a situation where Ravin is coming into a bad situation for more days. Now, again, whether he had anything to do with that or whether he's just using it is up for debate. But eventually those come to a head and he puts them down in favor of the queen, who then, again, almost guaranteed at this point, with his compulsion help, puts him into Elida's now vacant uh, advisor to the queen role. <laughs> um, the at which manager. point, yes, <laughs> no, assistant regional manager. <laughs> Um, and so he then uses that position to continue to compulse her and many other nobles in the court, uh, both for and against the queen, to effectively set himself up as the king of Andor, with Morgays basically just puppeting and or or being his puppet and parroting things that he would like her to do. You know, um, it reminds me a lot of um of people that are in uh like an opium haze like in the opium den mm. right Ooh. where they're very susceptible to suggestion they're kind of like whatever and if it's like for them it's it's not the opium it doesn't really matter so yep. you'll say like hey get i'll chop off your left testicle and i'll give you a bunch of opium and they're just like yeah whatever just give me the opium give me the opium yeah and they don't even notice when you chop off like whatever or or whatever the deal is and don't notice yeah 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 <laughs> they, they like part of their yeah, brain is like aware but it's yeah, yeah, yeah it's like on the peripherals of their of their awareness yep and morgaze is very much the same way and uh, like we were talking about earlier i do i how do i want to phrase this because i want to phrase this very carefully um because i do not <laughs> like anything that Robin does mm -hmm. correct but just like how you can appreciate an incredible hero you can also appreciate incredibly talented villains yes i and agree with that statement Robin has an incredible talent here for at least for a while having his cake and eating it too mm -hmm. because not only has he got more gays in a state where she's so focused on how much she quote unquote loves him that she will do anything he suggests to try to gain his approval and do his bidding. Mm -hmm. But she's so in love that she's also willing to, and, and kind of in this haze that she's willing to forgive and to some degree ignore his affairs. Well, and all of his indiscretions, not yeah. only sexually, but like all of the things that he is suggesting to her to do that well, she knows are wrong. Yeah, and what? that's absolutely the haze that he is putting in her in with. I love the way that I I don't remember which one of you described it, but the the sort of micro dosing the compulsion and the only really using it when you need it and doing more convincing them that what they're doing is right with the compulsion as an assistant rather than just being like I'm going to compulse you to the point where you can't say no. It's the, I know you well enough, and I know people well enough to convince you game theory-wise that what I'm suggesting is the right thing for you to do in your own benefit, and I'm just using the assistance of compulsion to make it just that much stronger that you feel this way, rather than just destroying your mind or forcing you into things. So... Uh, interestingly, we have uh, him in this position. He is very powerful. And this is where he starts to get a little big for his britches because he starts getting a little sloppy. Uh, when Matt, well, Elaine, knowing her mother, starts to be very worried about more gays because she has not heard from her mother or the things that she has heard from her mother 
or about her mother are very uncharacteristic for more gays. And there's so also, Elaine, there's also her concern about her mother finding out that she is not in the White Tower because she remarks that she would it is not beyond more gays to bring the full army of Andor against the White Tower to find her. Yes. And so, as I said, Elaine recognizes what, a good that what, what more gays is doing is very uncharacteristic. Uh, and that is, you know, again, a daughter kind of knows that if you're close to your mom. I'm not saying that no person could ever uh, pull one over on their daughter. But at the same time, if there's somebody who's going to notice, it's going to be one of your kids. We notice a lot more than you think. You um, know- and so. Go ahead. Well, and so I was saying that she then brings this to Matt's attention and says, Matt, I really need you to go to my mom and give her some information and check in on her. Because again, this is all, my mom's acting a little weird. The news that I'm getting from Camelin is a little weird. And I'm surprised that she isn't more concerned with things that are happening in the White Tower. So here, give her this letter that tells her not to worry, and that the White Tower's fine, because I don't want her to bring the full weight of the Andoran army on the White Tower. Because that Um, would be really bad right now. Please don't. And also check in on her, because I want to know why she doesn't know this already. Like, why we're not already having problems. And so Matt shows up in Camelin, goes to the Royal Palace, gives this letter, or tries to give this letter to the right people, And in his attempt to go ahead and make sure that it gets to the right people, overhears a conversation between Lord Gabriel and another person about basically his plans. And Matt's like, huh, that's fascinating. (laughs) And of course, again, not uh, right. Jumped in fucky. But like, again, I know that on some level, it's really Matt's luck or Tavir in nature that also puts him in the right place at the right time. I know that it's not just Ravin being bad at this because I'm sure he's not having all of these conversations around a bunch of people. Matt is special, but at the same time, bad slip up, dude. So anyway, he says this in front of Matt. All of this happens. Um, Morghese ends up getting with Matt's help and with Talonvor's help uh, and with uh, Basil Gill's help and a few different things, she gets herself away from Lord Gabriel and out of Cayman. And at this point, now that Morghese is gone and no one knows where she is, there is a rumor going around that Morghese has been killed. And since Lord Gabriel then steps into that position as the most logical person to do so, given his position in the court, there isn't an ascension, which is a little odd, because there should be another ascension. Uh, well, and because people... he's not the king. Yeah. Well, he's and then just... he helping out yes and he claims that he's looking for elaine but everybody kind of realizes that this is a little weird so there are many rumors going around that the person who had the most to gain from morgaze's death killed her and she's gone now and it it doesn't help no no go ahead sorry i think i think you're i think you're going there so go ahead well so and this is the point where rand exactly here's this rumor is extremely upset for one of his bays and goes all right i need to go take care of this now this is also after he has already started being uh being t- taught by asmodian different things asmodian gives him some uh some insight into what the other forsaken would be doing matt now has this information that things might be a little weird with lord gabriel there's a lot going on that rand kind of puts together with a lot of help that this probably is a forsaken and the likely culprit is robbie so he goes before you get to the next part yeah what i think is great is you have asmodine feeding in all this information to him Mm -hmm. hey this is probably what's happening, and I can tell you more once I see what's going on. Yes. Then you have Avienda, 
who he has finally kind of accepted being that right by him, shoulder to shoulder mm -hmm. fighter. I can't get rid of her. I might as well take care of her. Oh, and I fucking love her. <laughs> and then you got your boy, Matt, who's there, who's got this reputation for being extremely lucky and is, you know, his childhood friend. He's going to trust them all intrinsically when he moves into this next step. I just want like, just remember yeah. that whenever you get to what's about to happen. Yeah. So after all of this, Ravin has this great attention to detail on some levels that we've already talked about in this episode and should not go, you should keep in mind for my next statement. Rand, thinking that he's smarter than a Forsaken, which he's not not, but he's also very much not, uh, just has a bunch of people, including himself and some of his closest friends, gateway into Camelot to confront... They skim. Okay, you're right. They skim. You're right. You're right. But they travel by skimming oh. okay. into yeah. Camelin, directly into the city to confront Lord Gabriel, who they're fairly certain at this point is a Forsaken. And again, given Asmodian's expertise, are fairly certain they know which one. They roll and in with the A-team. They do. And at this point, Ravin has trapped the city so that if someone were to do something along these lines, they would immediately be attacked with flows of the one power. I think it's or alarms that are triggered by power. anybody channeling sighting. So they come in and all of them get wiped out with lightning except for Rand. Not all of Rand's retinue. There are definitely still soldiers that miss the lightning that are that are behind this, but all of the important named characters that we just talked about are just eviscerated. They, well, they essentially a bunch of walk IL. blindly into the Including trail. a bunch of IL, yes. Well, that's, they that's walk it. blindly. Yeah. It's Rand, Asmodi mm -hmm. Asmodian, Avienda, Matt, and a and a small army of IEL. Yes. So the, the IEL don't even pause as the lightning strikes and many oh, of them not even hit, a little but they just keep oh 100 but my thing is what i was saying keep in mind the the knowledge base that rand was counting on to feed him information on what to do as they're in the middle of this gone instantly the woman that he has recently realized that he has come to love that he has trusted to be at his side to fight in combat gone his childhood yes. friend who is the luckiest person he knows gone Go on. Yep. Immediately, Murphy's Law is in full effect. The immediate plan goes to absolute shit. And Rand just goes, huh, I'm going to do Super Saiyan about it. Yes. Well, and he, not only does he do that, but he, so he goes on this sort of cat and mouse cloak and dagger uh but what what memory here. does it trigger for him? And it's why I made the correction I did earlier about skimming. Because prior to this, Rand could only skim, which is almost like it's a mix between traveling through gateways and the ways. Create a platform right. and you slide through the space in between threads of the pattern. Yeah, they, they make a... Uh, Robert Jordan made a specific point to illustrate the fact that mm. he could only make the platform so big. Yeah. And... For some and reason, that's what constrained it to such a small army going yes. into Cambridge. And that for some reason, this point, it had the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai in the middle. But at this point, I wonder why. Rand gets so furious mm -hmm. at this Forsaken who has uh, killed Avienda and Matt. He's really not that upset about Asmodian because it's, you know, Asmodian. Well, I don't know. At this point, I feel like he's actually traveled with Asmodian enough to not only just gain theory of Asmodian's expertise, but, like, honestly, Rand has started to actually view Asmodian almost as a friend because he knows who he is. He does. I'm it not was... saying that he doesn't ever, or that he ever loses that, but at the same time, Asmodian really is sitting there rooting for Rand by this point because he's like, I have he knows he's dead otherwise. I am yeah. so fucked that I just need to hitch my chariot to the way of the, to the, to the army of the light 
because if he, I go back to the dark at any point, the dark one will just remove me. He's from an ally of so, necessity. Yeah. Yes. So random and, tangential and Rand thought. is aware of that, but it's sent again. An ally of necessity isn't necessarily not an ally. Exactly. It's just that they're not as much of an ally as you wish they were. <laughs> so relevant tangential thought. We see Rand after this and in the future, after Asmodian is gone tie people to him in such a way that to go against him spells immediate death and he makes himself yes. the only possible solution. Is this a decision that Rand cognizantly makes from his time with Asmodi and knowing that I don't have to question the loyalty of somebody who is loyal to me because they have absolutely no other choice. And and think about think about that too because this actually gets into a theme or point that i really want to discuss with robin and it's actually a great segue with asmodian because asmodian when we talk about rand and asmodian talking to each other mm -hmm. asmodian very very frequently points out that look dude yeah i did that thing yeah i grabbed that cup with flows of air and sent it to you but everybody just thinks it was you. Why would I out myself? There's no benefit for outing myself. So you're okay because there's no way I'm going to do anything to out myself. Because if I out myself, I'm dead. If I run away, I'm dead. I have no options apart from you. And Rand is like, Oh yeah, that's that's actually a really great point. I still don't trust you. I'm still going to keep an eye on you, but that's a really great point. And I think that kind of Daniel where you're getting at is that as time progresses and Rand is able to catch Asmodian being loyal to him on his own. I don't want to say he lets his guard down, but he gets more he comfortable. Yes. He gets more comfortable with Asmodian. He gets more well, comfortable having a Forsaken as a teacher, as a companion, as a compatriot, as a confidant. Lots of C's there. Yes. Well, see, they're, they're all taught, like, the childhood stories aren't that the Forsaken, you know, clamor at each other's throats. Right. The stories yes. are that the Forsaken collectively work to get together to accomplish the will of the Dark One, which so we all know the is the greatest bullshit. amount oh, of evil stories. possible. <laughs> yeah. And so you have Rand who's sitting there looking at Asmodian, and then there's Landfear who is uber gaga obsessed with him because you know, hey boy, you got a nice soul over there. Um, and she's <laughs> like, hey, don't worry. I put a shield on him that lets him channel just a trickle so that he can teach you so that you and I can become the new Adam and Eve of this world and take over the world. And um, I'm pretty sure that if I grew up raising sheep on a farm with a dad named Tam Althor, <laughs> who popped up with a Heronmark sword and barely survived, and I left not knowing if he was alive, that by the time I got to that position... And two of the most infamous evil people I have ever heard about in my life, besides in evil legend. incarnate, tell in me legend. One just got done trying to kill me. This other one popped up, says they don't want anything in return other than me to learn. Don't worry, I've made him safe for you. I was still thinking they're on the same fucking team. I'm not buying. And this, Rand does. Think of it like this. Think of it like this. If if you listening at home. We're sitting there one day, and all of a sudden, Adolf Hitler was like, hey, I'm here to teach you about how to be a better public speaker. Don't worry. I can't do anything on my own, but I can teach you how to be charismatic and convincing. Huh? Huh? Your initial reaction, as Rand's was, would be one of revulsion and absolute and total propulse like get away from me i don't want this or at but least it should be it, well okay it it should should be. Be. <laughs> you're one of those it individuals continue. that don't continue. feel that way it should be. uh there's a little button down below us that says unsubscribe go ahead and click yeah it. just unsubscribe. 
Also, also, if you want to just click the three dots and go to block, we're good with that. If you would like to uh, control alt or <laughs> your your life in game, in game, in game, not but, in reality, in game, you know. But the the reasons. issue then becomes, and, and like I said, this is this is a really great position I wanted to get to with regards to Robin, Doggy? because when we talk about Robin. And and I'm going to say this right now, and I and I hate this phrase, but I do want to actually put it out there. This is a trigger warning for you know a uh, uh, battered women or or abused wives and things like that. Because time and time again, you hear these stories about Let's go with uh, abused and battered individuals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, abused and battered individuals who are trying their hardest to leave their abusers. And mm-hmm. find it incredibly difficult to do. And I remember uh, in high school uh, volunteering for an organization who th- this was specifically a battered women's shelter. But one of the services they provided was we'll pull up to your house in a van and a truck. We will load up everything you want to bring with you clothing uh, precious articles children and we'll be gone in 30 minutes Mm -hmm. so when the abuser leaves the home we can pull up grab you grab your kids grab important things and be gone in 30 minutes and your abuser will never know what happened and Mm -hmm. i i was now when i volunteered for the organization it was like you know taking out their trash and cleaning up their facilities and it was it was a high school project it was a thing it wasn't anything well, as glorious as that like i, I don't do that like... in college but i couldn't do it because i am a member of the male gender and they were like <laughs> we i okay, mean no point like being i get it but being, understandably you know like i couldn't go sure. to their to like their location to help them out not because they were like you know man bad because they're like, these are survivors of trauma that yes. many of them just no. aren't mm-hmm. okay with. You know. And I was yeah. like, that's fine. And when I think about this, and when I saw people that would come in and were unsure of their decision, were, were oh my God, he's going to be so angry. He's going to be so angry. And it it took counselors. It took therapists to say, you are safe you're gone you you he's not gonna find you this is a safe home and even if he managed to find the location we have security on site Mm -hmm. nobody is allowed upon the the entrance of the facility without your explicit permission and where you've already listed this person off as an abuser and someone you don't want to see they're not getting close to you period end of story Mm -hmm. and um the 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 parallel i want to draw is that this is a very real scenario that happens every day people go through this women go through this especially and it's horrible it's terrible but the 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 thing that i keep thinking about is in this particular situation queen morgays is under compulsion of robin and we always assume it's by the one power and i'm going to say that it is i'm going to say that robert jordan wrote it specifically that it was actually the the work of the one power he did but we've talked about how subtle his use of the one power is and if we can see in our own world and i'm I'm using this example specifically because it's the example in the books a woman running from and escaping from an abusive male partner and even months later having thoughts of did i do the right thing oh my god he's gonna be so upset with me it 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 hurts so much to know that someone who cannot wield the power can do such damage imagine if you will, for a second, 
the damage that someone who can wield the power does and the strength of character of Queen Morghese to not only recognize that she is in an abusive situation, but to overcome actual compulsion weaves that have been set upon her. Now, maybe she has an advantage because she can channel. It's a spark. And I think she's recorded as the she is literally least, the weakest on the power. The track. weakest channeler in existence ever. I, in a, I'm not I sure. Know, that, to the but books. she's definitely the yeah. She's the she on might the power be the scale weakest we one have. on the power scale we have. But right, right. But the idea being, there are a lot of people who aren't named who are probably right there with her on that well, power scale. And we've even <laughs> we've even talked we've even talked in the Looking past you, about Miss how May twenty seven, right? Exactly. We've even talked in the past about how people talk about how um, males channel, and and the stronger you are as a channeler is reflective of how how. Uh, able you are to be dominant and it was like no that's completely not true because more gays that woman has strength of character that woman sure. is a strong character well and again it now Yet comes to a question channel. well and More i was gonna say spark. it's now a question of what are you calling strength what are you calling strength with the power what are you calling just general human strength does one help the other? All of that different stuff. And so, yeah. Uh, all of this to Excuse say... Excuse me, Mr. Schwarzenegger. How much of the one power can you channel? <laughs> I pick things up and put them down. <laughs> I, will help the, I will help the channelers with the picking up and the exploding of the blo- the rocks and the, the, and the, the moving and the, and the shaking. Of the end, the... get your hands out of the cookie jar! Get to the portal! Oh, get, to the portal. Say, get to the portal! Get to the igloo! Oh. <laughs> what are you doing? You put your hands in the pole of winds! So again, uh, I, I agree a lot with a number of different things that Josh was saying, and I'm going to sort of do a little bit of, of fun stuff here into my final thoughts. Um, because I do think that, again, one of the reasons that this is here One of the reasons that this story exists, one of the reasons that Robert Jordan thought that it was important to put this kind of character in the story is it is easier to see when this is done with magic. It's easy to look at this situation and say, oh yeah, no, he just used magic and everything went his way. But that's why he writes it this style. There is someone who walks in and blitzkriegs people with compulsion, and it looks real different than this. This is something different. And I really appreciate that on so many levels, Robert Jordan is suggesting that it doesn't need to be just magic. You can be destructive with a, you know through a lot of different mediums. And that is one of the reasons that it is so satisfying that in this particular thing, Rand and his retinue show up in Camelin and half of them, more than half of them, just get immediately wiped off the chessboard. Rand then goes Super Saiyan 3, follows him around, relearns a new weave he never had any business relearning, uh, cat and mouse is Robbie and all over the place, and then Bale fires his ass to death. He Bale Literally fires like, Ravine into the Shadow Realm. To That's five years out. ago. I'll Bale fire your ass five years ago. Uh, not that far, even remotely. Not because quite. then Morghese but, wouldn't be compulsed. But, but he does Bale fire him all the way back to the point where his friends, closest allies and advisors that he brought with him and were shot off the chessboard immediately are now not only back on the chessboard, but they don't even realize what's happened. And again, it's this very satisfying end to a situation that is very uncomfortable. And you kind of get in there and you you hear the story of Ravin 
and the mistakes that he's making. And by mistakes, I mean like actual active mistakes. They're not just, oh, he made a mistake. No, like he's making terrible decisions that are very in line with him being a forsaken on the shadow of or on the side of the shadow and things like that. And with seemingly very little to no moral compass. And in the end, makes one too many miscalculations and gets ran on his ass and just he gets ran eliminated he gets randed yes he gets bail bail franded <laughs> and it is it is very satisfying for that to be the end of a character who does such kind of horrible things what one of the most evil i know his story isn't doesn't go but God damn, what an evil guy. And I want to throw out there one other thing that is sort of my last thought on Ravin. In the story, we have a number of people who make really, really bad decisions, either because they're bad people or they're stupid. We have a lot of different ones of that. Um, and I don't want to categorize bad decisions and evil choices and things like that. but. I do appreciate that almost everybody seems to understand and recognize that Ravin's choices are evil. From the minute he shows up on page, everybody seems to be under the impression that he is bad. There are other characters in the Wheel of Time who do things that are not on par because I don't want to again I don't want to quantify what they're doing as like this one's more bad than than this one but in right. very much the same vein of what Ravin does and there seem to be some people who are on the fence about whether that is bad I want to point you to the character of Ravin if what Ravin is doing is immediately bad to you other people in the wor world of the wheel of time should also be bad to you if Especially you are if they one don't of, use the power to do it i i would say just as much because as i said i don't like the like quantifying badness because bad is bad well, it's, it's not a quantify that's an ease of access oh uh, Huey Rob, Lewis Robin has sometimes has an, bad is an bad. indisputable power that he can reach out to and use to force things without any need of convincing or any other kind of manipulation to happen. There are yeah. other individuals in the series that do the same heinous things and they don't have that ease of access. Yes. And I just want to throw out there that if you are one of the people who sees Ravin as bad, extend that to everyone who is ravin adjacent that's all i'm saying uh, and that's adjacent. my and that's my <laughs> final thoughts on ravin got what he deserved uh and really is definitely a character who as i said earlier is very well written in the fact that i appreciate their presence in the story because it makes it realistic i do not appreciate their presence or the fact that people are like that. I just appreciate that Robert Jordan, to make his story realistic, included a character that makes the story more realistic. Hard agree. You want me to um, go or do you want to go, Josh? I don't care. You you do it. You go. You go, Andrew. Okay. Uh, beauty, bef a beauty before age. Well, that's great because Daniel already went. So I guess I'm age. Wow. I'm age. Beautiful name. Daniel's beauty. You're somewhere in between. So I... That's not even action. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no. Cows. Daniel's beauty. Josh is age, and I'm somewhere between, so I'm beige. Beige. Ah. Yeah, go go beige there we go see i didn't use up all the shitty puns before recording so white <laughs> so white you're beige oh oh yeah all right go ahead um, andrew so thoughts on uh ravine uh, i very much agree with daniel on i i don't want to misconstrue anything as 
trying to quantify evil. Um, uh, for, for lack of a better comparison, I'm going to go very uh, Christian mindset with evil, sin is sin, they're all equal to each other, they're all mm-hmm. equally horrible, and it doesn't matter if the you've got the Lord. like 0.1 sins or you've got all of the sins, you're just pure evil in regards to the forsaken. So mm-hmm. hopefully that analogy makes sense. Yeah. Um, for me, Ra- Ravine is no more or less evil than any of the other forsaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what we see Ravine do has that ability to resonate more with us on an emotional mm-hmm. level. Yep. Most people, unfortunately, can resonate with either being a subject of uh, this sort of manipulation and abuse uh, to varying degrees, or they have friends or family that have been victims of it as well, irregardless of age, irregardless of gender, irregardless of pick a category. Because uh, it does affect everybody of all uh, of all races, creeds, ages, genders, uh, whatever have you. Correct. Uh, not equally, but it does affect everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you think it doesn't, well, uh, uh, there. I don't know. Do some more research. <laughs> That's all I can hope for you. I'll pray for you. Um, <laughs> bless your bless heart. your heart. <laughs> it's, yeah, bless your heart. There you go. Why did? Oh, I'm not gonna go there. Oh my god. Anyway. <laughs> That's, um, that's a topic for another show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, like, how did like the most southern person not make that comment? Well, you you said the other. I, most you were trying to thing. be nice. That's how. Oh, okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's the, right. I'll pray for you. That's pretty southern. I'm okay. going to just tell you right now. Oh, I mean, fair enough. Um, where were your thoughts? It's a it's a difficult pill to swallow to read about things like this. It really is. Um, because really? it's so uncomfortable, and I, I, I have to believe, and I'm, I'm sure there was a talk about it. Uh, but the Robert Jordan and Harriet both agreed this needed to be in the story because of some of the same reasons that Daniel pointed out earlier. If you find what Ravine does inherently morally apprehensible, this is terrible. This is which you evil, should. which you should. And if you don't, maybe call a therapist. Um. You have examples, both from the same aside sort of a point of view, um, and from opposite points of view. If if you know what I'm talking about, you know, you know yeah. One of those. If you know, you know things. If you don't, uh, look up Pylon in regards to an opposite point of view kind of thing. Ooh. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> because that's still somehow a point of contention. That's definitely so, not a polarizing topic at all. Yeah. But anyway. then again, at the, not to defend anybody, but Ravine is still one of the 13, quote unquote, most evil entities in the world. So this is MO, like having people that wiped entire cities off the face of the earth, having people like Grindel that can pulse the shit out of dozens of people just because she happens to find them pretty in the moment or enjoys breaking down rulers. Like we should never be surprised at how evil all of the forsaken and chosen are and the individuals that want to be forsaken or chosen and the people that work for the forsaken slash chosen. It, it's always kind of surprising when you put it into a real life context, but it, it never should be um, just by the very nature of who they are. And Robin, I think, is one of those kind of measuring sticks that helps remind us just how truly actually evil this group of individuals are. Because Ravine doesn't try to be the best amongst the group. He doesn't try to attain all this like fortune and fame. He just says, you know, give me my consorts. Let me manipulate my regions and kingdoms. Leave me the fuck alone. And I'm good. Which sounds like very simplified, easy things that, that, that on face value don't sound terrible. But you got to remember what faction you're talking about. These aren't consorts necessarily that are there because they love the guy. If you think Morghese is probably the only one that he used compulsion on, <laughs> I I highly doubt it. That is not somebody yeah. like Robin does. Like I have some um, very expensive timeshares to go ahead and sell you. Yeah, 
Um, Ocean if you, if you want it, honestly, Arizona. if you want it, if you wanted to describe robbing in two words that I normally don't use, uh, toxic masculinity is a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. A pretty it's good fair. phrase for robbing. Um, so, uh, in the middle of the time when people talk about that, robbing is one of the people that I, I definitely think about. Uh, yes. That. Mm-hmm. Yes. And beyond. I, All that yeah. being said, um, Ravine as a plot device. Uh, honestly, I I don't think we needed it. I think we could have definitely lived without it. I don't love the bullshit arc uh, that gets more gays off the throne. I think there were plenty of better, easier ways to get more gays off the throne because there's no payoff to Ravine manipulating and controlling Camelin other than a little bit of inconvenience and turmoil for Rand and party. Um, there's really nothing that comes of it other than a point in the story that pushes more gays to then run to the Wheel of Time equivalent of the Westboro Baptist fucking church. Like, that's it. It, it, it doesn't pay off. It doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's this really going around your asshole to get to your elbow way of getting more gays off the throne when you could have done it much easier and just had her say, like, hey, the world's fucking crazy. Elaine, take over. And I'm going to stop there because uh, I've been rambling for like five minutes. <laughs> no, here, look, here's the thing. When it comes to final thoughts, you know, um, first off, I like going last because you guys made all my best points for me. And I, I like, I get to go out on the fringe and call it a day. But w- w- one thing that we know from this book series, and I will say this, I've said it before and I've said it again. Robert Jordan does what so many other great stories do. And that is, yes, we're in a world with magic and super warriors and all these like incredulous, amazing, wonderful things that do not exist in real life. But he paints a story based entirely on the human experience. Entirely realistic scenarios. Queen Morgays, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are in life. You can, if you're not careful, find yourself in a scenario in which someone is manipulating your life robin Mm -hmm. as we know as a forsaken first off is evil one of the things that robert jordan does really really well is write evil characters who really really evilly like they're evil like you even kind of want to give there there's a there's an empathetic piece in all of us, I think, that wants to live, like, understand why, understand what is, why is this part, why, why, what could bring you to do that? Oh, now we have a backstory so we can understand why, and oh, now we have, and that's why, you know, Broadway musicals like Wicked are so popular, because we want to know why the Wicked Witch of the West is the way she is that's why the tv series once upon a time was so amazing because you had the villains who were kind of not villains like they were villains but at the same time they were kind of put in that situation and i think that robert jordan does a really great job of reminding us that no actually sometimes people are just assholes like sometimes People make active choices to be assholes. Are there underlying motivations for why? Sure. But at some point in time, you got to say, yeah, I understand that what I went through is really fucked up. I don't care. I'm still going to commit evil atrocities against my fellow human beings. And at that point in time, at the point in time in which you make conscious decisions to perpetrate evil or to perpetrate control over another purpose, an, another person, you are now 
evil. Trauma Which, is no excuse to be a dick. At some point in time in your life, you have to take accountability for what you and I'm I'm a person who has gone through this. I won't get into details here, but at, at some point in time in your life, you have to go, oh shit, my actions are a result of trauma or abuses I've experienced in the past. And now I need to acknowledge that and not continue that cycle. And it's more difficult than people realize, but it does That's not excuse you. That's the point where it's no longer you. an excuse, by the way. Is what it I meant. it mm -hmm. does not excuse you from continuing the cycle of negativity, toxicity, hatred, bigotry, and prejudice. It does not excuse you. Once you recognize that scenario. Now, did Robin recognize that? I would make a case that all Forsaken recognize that and made a conscious choice to side with the Dark One. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you and your apologetic excuses for why they did what they did. The Forsaken deserve no excuses. Well, I mean, they kept every Robin single one really... of them are evil AF. Robin was kept really basic, right? Basically, basic just thirst for power. Yep, manipulating yeah, it's just, misogynistic this quintessential of kind of like thing that people offer uh, men seeking power in like fantasy movies or movies in general. Yes. I can offer you wealth, I can offer you positions of power, and I can offer you beautiful women. That is Robin's desires, MO, what he pursues the entire time. Offer me power. <laughs> offer me money. Yes. Offer anything me anything I ever wished for. Anything is, you want and like, more. The Dark Please. One was just Queen Xerxes. I want to my Robbie. father back, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Pretty much it. <laughs> Sorry. But we all agree. Uh, Robin, you are an absolute dirtbag, an absolute douchebag, and uh, I'm just you know, a chosen dirtbag, baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, on a final note here, there are some parallels to Robin. We'll make this super, super quick, because we need to end the episode here in just a second. Um, Ravine is probably based on the Rakshasha Lord um, Ravana, which is from the Hindu epic, the Ramayana. Um, these are demonic magic users. Ravana is, uh, Ravana is a king, an excellent administrator and military leader, described as tall, dark-skinned, and very attractive, both in appearance and charisma, and has a penchant for women, keeping several wives and... Take note of this. Kidnapping and trying to seduce a married princess. Um, like Ravana, Ravine is very attractive uh, or attracted to women, keeps many lovers, some against their consent, a competent ruler, and a very powerful magic user. Additionally, he is also described as dark skin and bears clear etymological similarities to the legendary Rakshash. So there is your real world parallel there. Let us know what do you think uh, about Ravine down below in the comments and the feedback in the Discord. Um, let us know. Do you think his character arc uh, actually built and added to the story? Do you think we could have gotten everything that we got from the Ravine story arc without Ravine? We could have maybe had 12 chosen instead of 13. Or maybe he could have pulled a damage dread and, you know, never fucking be around until the very end. Who knows? <laughs> uh, Demand but, dread. The man, the man, dread, not damage, dread. That's a Robert Jordan Shh, blunder. Yeah. Or did I say that intentionally to make you oh. question the need? Oh, for, yeah, for uh -huh. yeah. That's Thanks everyone happened. for being here. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for being the awesome person that you are. We at the Black Tower podcast appreciate you on the deepest levels. We appreciate you for listening. We appreciate you for subscribing to our YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. We appreciate and grateful to you for liking and leaving a comment down below about what you liked about the episode or maybe what you didn't like about the episode. But if you didn't like the episode, please bring receipts because we want to address that and we want to have a conversation about it. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in for this week's Dose of Madness. And we hope that uh, you leave here just a tad bit more insane than you were when you first got here. 
So from all of us here at the Black Tower, I have been your Sorabon Mahale Sunshine. I have been your Bajan Mahale Unicorn. And I have been your Amin Khan Mahale Rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> and again, from all of us here at the Black Tower Podcast, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we hope that you had a lovely morning wherever you are. And in case we don't see you again, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Always an adventure. God damn always it. watching. <laughs> always running the show. Oh, uh, double the in the tower, you can bring, bring your pain. Just fitting in In the tower We can help you We will make you sing